Sure. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Our first item of business is approval of the minutes of the November 4th, 2013 Committee of the Whole meeting. Um, I'll first ask if there are any changes, corrections, additions, or deletions to the minutes. <laughs> Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve. And motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next is a water plant capital overview, which is being presented to us by Mike Thomas this evening. If we have to listen to his voice one more time today. <laughs> Just turn on XRT. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, this evening, staff would like to present to uh, yourselves a review of our capital for the water plant uh, uh, back on the December 2nd, or excuse me, December 10th, Committee Finance Committee meeting with a, an extensive review of our capital. We didn't have an opportunity to get too much into the water fund, so we wanted to present to you a quick overview of some of our water capital uh, in the upcoming five years, primarily on our modules. Uh, with, the, with me this evening is uh, Brian Hackman. Brian is with Strand Associates. Uh, Strand Associates is the engineering firm we've been working with for the past two years as our consultants uh, down at the water plant. So Brian's going to add a few comments to some of these slides as well. Apologies. Uh, to begin <coughs> with, uh, the city's water plant was put into operation in April of 2004. We use what is referred to as an ultrafiltration membrane system. Uh, ultrafiltration is defined as a low pressure physical removal process uh, whereby the solids are separated and forced <coughs> through a membrane containing pores 10,000 time, 10, times smaller than those of human skin. So we simply bring water in from the lake. We put it through the membranes, it goes into our tank that then is uh, tapped with fluoride and chlorine and sent to the residents. Uh, the, the cutoff for ultrafiltration, many were, were asked many a times, what things do the, do the membranes uh, remove? And this chart uh, shows that basically it will remove uh, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, bacteria, viruses, uh, everything to a 0 0.01 micron level. Uh, anything past that, uh, the membranes do not catch, but again, it catches a majority of uh, uh, bacteria and viruses in the water. Uh, the plant is made up of eight skids, 24 modules per skid. These modules are 18-inch modules, or the largest uh, modules on the market, uh, so a total of 192. They're made and produced by Aquasource Incorporated, uh, located in Toulouse, France. Uh, again, we placed the original plant in service in April of 2004. In 2006, we actually received brand new modules. The potting material, which is the material on top of the module, was beginning to separate. The company realized that they had a faulty uh, uh, problem with that specific potting material and replaced all the modules for us. Uh, the modules themselves are shelf life. Uh, they have a three-year uh, shelf life when they're stored between 34 and 59 degrees. Uh, it takes approximately four months for Aquasource to build the modules and ship them to us. So on this evening's council agenda, you'll see that we're asking City Council uh, to allow us to purchase the FY15 modules. Uh, the modules we know are, are need to be replaced after 1% of the fibers. Uh, have broken. There are 30, uh, 350,000 uh, in each. Uh, this is the module pricing per year. Uh, we began replacing the modules in 2009. As you can see, uh, the price dropped significantly in 2012, and that was twofold. Number one, we began to deal directly with Aquasource. Uh, there was no middleman, but number two, Alderman Moore, at his suggestion, uh, recommended that we transport the modules by sea, which uh, saved us a lot of money. So we have continued that practice, uh, and for this year's purchase, they've, they've dropped even more, more so because of the, the higher number we're purchasing. I'm going to let Brian go ahead and uh, review a few other slides uh, as far as plants within the area. 
Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Didn't we buy extras last year with the money that we saved, or two years ago with the money we saved? Have we already gone through those? We, yes. We, as soon as we receive the modules, we put them into service. It will take, depending upon the quantity, uh, it will, this quantity for the 88 that we're going to receive will take a good three or four weeks for us to put into service. But our goal is to try and get those in before the high pumpage in, in June. So, yes, as soon as we receive them in May, we, put, we take the old ones out, new ones in. Because with the money we saved, we bought extras. Correct. But we put those in. Not many extras. I think not we many. Bought two or two, oh, okay. two or right. four extras. But yes. <clears throat> thank you, Council. Thank you, Mike. Um, one of the key things in this slide is that membrane treatment facilities are on Lake Michigan, and Lake Forest is one of the 11 uh, facilities uh, that treat uh, Lake Michigan water. Um, with Highland Park being the newest addition, uh, Lake Forest is one of the. Um, Younger or one of the older plants uh, relative to production on the lake. <clears throat> With uh, the membrane modules are one wear component as part of these membrane systems and basically uh, the modules do require replacement to maintain uh, production capacity. I just show a picture of uh, some example membrane modules there on your left and uh, what happens is over time we can see in the charts to the right that as the, the membranes follow or the permeability decreases, the capacity or overall capacity of the water plant generally decreases as well. And that's what really drives the replacement of the membrane modules. Because as what happens is the operators uh, basically are trying to maintain production. Dirt and debris get on the membrane modules and then the modules need to be cleaned and to, to be able to produce a maintainable capacity and as the membranes wear, the cycle becomes more of an issue uh, where it affects the operators and staff and production capacity of the plant and then drives basically into the membrane replacement in this case. Lake Forest is not alone. And uh, having looked at the overall uh, history of the other membrane treatment facilities, you'll see in the back of the graph some of the details relative to that. And I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, but what you can see on the graph here is their membrane replacement frequency based on the percentage of membrane uh, systems in the area. And uh, most of the membrane replacements occur in about a five-year frequency. Uh, there's some limited cases where there's a three-year replacement uh, frequency, and some plants have seven or greater years of replacement. Lake Forest falls in about that four to eight year time period and has been gradually replacing modules as the plant has been operating. So I would say above average as far as being able to maintain the membrane modules. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Mike for his remainder of his slides. One of the items that's listed in or that is proposed in our FY15 uh, water fund capital is to do a plant optimization and performance study. Uh, basically doing a head-to-toe review of our operation of the water plant uh, and to work with Brian and Strand Associates to make sure we are operating at the most efficient w way possible. Uh, very similar to the stormwater study that we did this past calendar year, we wanted to do the exact same thing with our water plant. Uh, things, uh, we, we simply want to make sure with all the equipment that is down there that we are optimizing everything and getting the production uh, that we should be out of the plant. So these are various items listed that we will be reviewing and performing uh, in the study. Uh, in addition to that, these are dollars that are currently budgeted in the five-year uh, water fund for, these are specific to the water plant. Again, water fund covers not only water plant, water main, and sanitary sewer. It covers those three items in our capital plan. These numbers are simply for those items, uh, it and our water plant. Uh, next Monday evening, we'll be having our public works committee meeting and the main topic that we'll be discussing will be uh, developing a proposed structure for our water rates. Uh, in doing that, we wanted to put together this chart and it, as it relates not only to the rates, but obviously to the water plant itself. Um, and this chart basically shows what our five-year average is per month. So we took the past five years in January, uh, looked at the total pumpage, averaged it. We did it for all 12 months. And as we all would expect to see uh, during the months of basically May through September, pumpage increases significantly. Um, <clears throat> 
we would obviously uh, have fewer problems if we were simply supplying the daily potable needs, which is approximately three and a half million gallons a day. Uh, but our challenges arise when we get into this higher pumpage. So as we noted, uh, next Monday evening uh, at Municipal Services at 630 is the Public Works Committee meeting. Uh, all of the City Council members are invited to attend. Uh, but again, this is something that Chairman Pandelian asked the Public Works Committee to study and evaluate. And we will be doing so at our next meeting and then bringing forth a uh, recommendation to the full Finance Committee and City Council. So with that, that completes our presentation. We wanted to allow time for questions, if you had any. Um, go from there. I, how do you clean the, the membranes? Do you backwash them? We backwash them. We have two backwash pumps. Um, depending upon their use, in other words, the frequency of the backwash is much higher in the summer months than it is currently, simply because we're pumping more water through them and they get dirtier and more a uh, faster time period. But backwash pumps, we take clean water and we simply backwash the filters. Uh, typically during the summer months, that will happen close to every 45 minutes, sometimes a little bit sooner, 35 minutes. Also, oh, they're um, constantly being backwashed. Yes, but then we go on uh, days like today where we're at a very low pumpage, three million gallons a day. We might be upwards of two, three hours uh, at least. So, but we also will, during the winter months, take different skids offline and we'll do maintenance on one of the eight skids. Um, so that will put a little bit higher production demand on the remaining skids that are in service. I thought I read in, in the attached report that the life expect expectancy of the membranes were seven to 12 years, but it looks like we're really on average changing them over <coughs> in five years. Um, Brian, Brian noted four to eight. Uh, when, we were, when we were studying this, this system and when we initially purchased the, the modules, uh, we were told it was approximately seven to 10. I think we are going to be, in, in our graph show, that we are on the higher end, and I think we will continue to be on the higher end. We initially, when we put this plan into service in 2004, had a lot of issues with air. Membranes do not do well with air, and when you have air in your system, the module fibers tear and break very quickly and very easily. We went through the plant head to toe and found different areas where air was getting into the system, especially when we would turn the plant off and have to turn it back on in the winter time. Um, if we hit, if we go below a certain demand, we call it on our pumps the pump curve. We go below that pump curve, we have to turn the water plant off. Well, you turn the water plant on, it generates air, we get air in the filters, the modules. So since then, three years ago, we uh, added sidearm pumps to our water plant, which allows us to pump at a very low level and not turn the water plant off. Therefore, we don't create the air, therefore the modules are lasting longer, and we're seeing that, we're realizing those uh, you know, I, I ask you these questions because every time we talk about the water plant and buying filter membranes from Toulouse, France, I think, isn't there a better way to produce water and to have a domestic supplier? <laughs> Before these membranes, what was the technology and how's our cost per thousand gallons <clears throat> produced compared with the membranes to the previous technology? Uh, good question, and I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to give you uh, an answer because it would be a very quick off the cuff. Um, water beforehand, and, and for a lot of water plants still, uh, it's a basic sand filtration plant where you bring water in, uh, you put chemicals in the water, you stir those chemicals up, which creates flock, basically snowflakes and those heavy materials drop through different sedimentation basins. So it grabs those molecules, it makes flock, it drops to the bottom. Then it filters through the sand and your water is filtered and it goes up, um, pumps to the residents. Thinking back at our water plant budget, um, I think there has been an increase in our water plant budget, but I do not think it's been significant. In other words, we had seen an increase in our electricity but we also have seen a decrease in our chemicals, significant decrease in our chemicals. Uh, in addition to that, we signed up with a co-op, I want to say it was five or six years ago with our electricity. So we have really brought the rates down on the electricity. So that's something that we can, I can look at and bring back to you to be able to 
give you a better number. There have to be a lot of other water producers along Lake Michigan who are not using the membrane technology, correct? Correct. And is this costing us less than it costs them to produce a gallon of water? How, do you know how the city of Chicago produces water? Brian, you can help Jardine. And Jardine, yeah. city of Chicago, is the world's largest water plant. Uh, you can be and there, just, on that. Yeah, just to give you an idea, um, it's a very simple, relatively simple process where uh, you, do find, you do screening uh, for solids, then you go into clarification basins to remove the solids, just like what Mike was talking about and then granular filters thereafter. And one of the things with Jardine is, is that it's such a large plant that they gain some economies of scale in their cost per thousand gallons of water uh, compared to a, a lot of the smaller water communities that are one-tenth to one-hundredth of the size of that, that one particular facility. So I do agree with Mike, we, we can come back to you with the answer as far as relative cost <coughs> difference. One of the other things from a cost standpoint that can't be measured and to add to the discussion a little bit is the overall improvement to water quality that the membrane filters do provide uh, compared to granular filters. And the membrane filters are removing more solids and providing a, a higher quality water and an improvement to service to the customers um, using membranes compared to the conventional type treatment that Chicago or Jardine and some of the other facilities on Lake Michigan would use. There's no question the water quality is outstanding. Uh, and I was always under the impression city of Chicago water was pretty good too. And it's just a shame that we've got these expensive filters and then in the summertime we're, we're taking that high quality water and using it to irrigate lawns and it, it, it just seems to be a killer. Yeah, no, I understand, understand the comment and, and I, I don't know, Mike, if you want me to add to that or, um, <coughs> but you know, obviously from a conservation standpoint too, obviously, um, you know, a lot of communities, especially out in the Southwest, uh, look at using gray water more for those purposes, those types of things, and have entirely different systems because water is such an a uh, important resource in the area, a limited resource. Uh, we happen to be, fortunately, very water rich here in this area. So, yeah, you no, know, I appreciate the comment. I have a couple of questions. One, on, um, on the map that you showed us of all the different communities that are using filtration technology are they all using the same the same system that that Lake Forest is using or are there different systems or are all these guys buying filters from this one factory in Toulouse <laughs> there are six different manufacturers and so there's six, six different round pegs for six different square holes um, yeah, none of these systems, other than maybe uh, I think five of the water treatment facilities on Lake Michigan have a common technology out of the 11. Uh, but yeah, there's five, five different suppliers of membranes in just these 11 water treatment plants alone. So these are different, different membranes coming from different suppliers for different plants that are slightly different in design? Yes. Presumably, okay. Exactly. So how many of these guys are using the same system that Lake Forest is using? None. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how <laughs> uh, Lake Forest is unique. Yeah. How many of these, how many of, uh, how, how viable these guys in France are? Um, well, there are other, um, there are other systems in the United States that do use Aquasource and they are primarily um, more distributable in Europe. Um, I would say uh, from the standpoint of Aquasource, there are other manufacturers who have more substantial installations in the United States than them. So. Well, let's. For the moment, let's ponder what would happen if, for whatever reason, that company no longer functioned or stopped producing these particular filters. Mm -hmm. um, and what would be the consequence of that? Well, uh, from the standpoint of getting, being able to get direct replacements for the system uh, would obviously become the first challenge, <coughs> um, the, as there are no other OEM suppliers that fit that exact mold. Um, there are some manufacturers who have gone in, there's at least one manufacturer I'm aware of that has gone in and retrofitted their membrane modules into the Aquasource with some, I would say, substantial uh, infrastructure improvements that way. Um, and that is becoming more of a, more of an option. Um, but it's, you know, it's either that or replace the entire infrastructure relative to the skids and the modules that are involved with the equipment to change suppliers. But you can shift over without having to completely rebuild the entire water plant. Theoretically. Yeah, okay. 
We don't, we, don't, we don't know what other things would be impacted by just the shift from those membrane modules, whether or not the pumps, the waste handling, those things do have to be looked at if it was a complete change from one manufacturer mm -hmm. to another. Mm -hmm. Real quick, as far as the, the Aquasource modules are 18 inch in diameter. Uh, they're the largest size membrane module on the market. The rest of these are much smaller. So the reason we chose to go with Aquasource is we knew what our highest demand was, and we also knew the area that we were dealing with down at the water plant. If we were to switch, and this is the connection, if we were to go with these other membrane manufacturers, would we be able, in the square footage of that water plant, be able to put a 14 or 16 MGD plant in? The, problem, the answer is no. We don't have enough space. Uh, it would take a much higher significant number of modules to be able to get 14 or 16 MGD out of that plant. Uh, so that was the reason that we decided, one of the primary reasons we decided back in 2000, 2002 to go with the Aquasource membranes. And you mentioned before that we've gotten some economies on uh, chemicals. Is that because, because of this technology we don't need to use the chemicals or is it because we're able to buy them more price efficiently for some reason? First. Uh, we, we, we don't buy the chemicals. We simply buy um, fluoride, uh, and then we produce our own sodium hypochloride rather than purchasing chlorine. Uh, we actually make sodium hypochloride on site, and we'll feed it into the water. So, and do you uh, use as much of that as you used to use with the old system? Uh, the chlorine, we use a very similar amount, yes, um, and the fluoride is regulated by the state. So those two haven't changed simply because it's what we're required to put into the water once it has been filtered. Uh, and the state tells us exactly how much has to be put in. That's just the fluoride? Fluoride and the chlorine. So they, you have to but put in the same amount, of, even if we didn't need the chlorine, you'd still have to put it in? The, the, the chlorine is required for disinfection, disinfectant once the water has been filtered and as it goes into the water main system, we have to put a certain amount of chlorine <coughs> and a certain amount of fluoride. The state dictates that to us. But as far as the filtering process, remember I spoke about this idea of where we add chemicals and it mixes with the bacteria. Um, those chemicals now are no longer needed because we simply bring raw water into the plant, put it through the membranes, the water's clean, it's filtered. Um, so it's those chemicals that we've saved on. I have noticed that the filter under my sink in the kitchen almost never needs to be replaced. Good. That's a good thing. And Mike, just quick question. Have, have we ever thought of just putting out the bid to some of these other, other companies like Simons, uh, seeing what they'd come in with, uh, just to retrofit maybe some of the skids to see what they'd come up with numbers-wise? Um, Brian has been speaking with uh, Siemens and Coke. Uh, those two companies to look at a potential expansion of the water plant. And if, in fact, we were to add four million gallons, where could we do that on site and what would the cost be? So from that standpoint, yes, we have begun to talk to both companies to get an idea of what their expenses would be. And just for the sake, is Simons or Siemens, is it a, a domestic company? Both of them are. Uh, okay. Maryland and Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the men, of course, they put you yes. So shipping we'd save on also? Correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is other matters. Are there any other matters that anyone would like to discuss? Hearing none, I um, will um, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion's adjourned. Meetings adjourned. <laughs> do we do we move now to go to executive? Well, first we need a motion to appoint um, Alderman Novit as acting chair of tonight's meeting, or acting mayor of tonight's meeting. So moved. Second. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> do you need to do roll call on that? No. Okay. We'll assume that was a unanimous yes. <laughs> <laughs> And yes. now we'll need a motion to go into executive session. Yeah, that's just. Roll call to commence the city council meeting. Second. 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 Second.
Okay, Mayor Schoenheider is absent. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg is absent. Alderman Palmer is absent. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Mr. Acting Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. And for everyone who is present, this is the uh, January 6, 2014 meeting of the Lake Forest City Council. Uh, we're going to begin our meeting with uh, my asking that we uh, have a motion to move into executive session. So moved. Second. And, and this would be for purposes of uh, discussion of uh, disposition of property under 2C6 of the open meeting. And would this be a roll call vote? It's a roll call. Uh, Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Six yay, zero nay, motion carries. And we'll adjourn into executive session. Yeah.